What is up, fellow Blue Beetle Battalion members? Welcome to my Blue Beetle No Spoilers review. I literally just got out from seeing it at my local cinema. I pride myself with giving you the best impression of the movie without getting into any of the spoiler details. And somehow I managed to talk about it for a very long time with, without giving away spoilers. I don't know. So Blue Beetle, man, wh where do I begin? Because, you know, I, I think I'll start off by saying a lot of people had apprehensions about this movie, as did I, like, don't get me wrong, quite quite low-key, looking forward to it, but at the same time, couldn't deny that the marketing gave off, you know, a, a certain tropey, cliche, superhero origin story formula, right? And, and the thing I want to say right off the bat is that it really is a fun time. And I think that is honestly what makes this work very well. You, you have all of the fun and wonder of a new character like Jaime coming into his own as Blue Beast to discovering the wonder of what comes with Kajida, the Scarab. And even though a lot of that apprehension, as I just mentioned, was about the look of this new hero origin coming into his powers like we've seen with that before many, many times, I would say, honestly, if, if that is the main thing putting you off with this movie, I would say don't worry about that so much. I mean, I'm not going to deny. It. Do not get me wrong. There is for sure this familiarity of formula we've seen in superhero movies movies in the past decades, such as coming into your own, finding your purpose, embracing it, and then rising up by the third act to, to come through and save the day, so to speak. But if you were to just evaluate something just simply through the lens of that, I would say, well, okay, that, that doesn't have much substance to it. But the thing about Blue Beetle is I can happily say it manages to bring Blue Beetle to the big screen in a way that captures relevancy and, most importantly, worthwhile entertainment served with surprisingly emotionally heavy moments that we'll get into in just a second because this movie is very much so about you know, Jaime Reyes, Blue Beetle, but embedded with the, the spirit of family. Also, another first impression of mine that I think served this movie very, very well, and actually goes on to serve other movies in the superhero space, is that one thing I think it had going for it is that it was fairly self-contained. Like, not fairly, but pretty damn self-contained. Of course, this is technically a prelude, if you will, to James Gunn's DCU, and we know Shola Madueña's Blue Beetle will be continuing on in James Gunn's DCU. He's made that very, very clear. But on the bottom line here of what I'm trying to get to is that since it doesn't make a humongous effort or really remotely any big efforts to connect to the larger DC universe, only really in some pretty cool Easter eggs and some references that are so subtle, it doesn't feel so weighed down with the responsibility of having to serve up all of these other things to pad out this larger universe. And this way, it allows you as an audience to get a lot more substance out of the movie's story and characters. And so going back to when it comes to a very family-centric story, I can imagine some people are still thinking though, but haven't we seen that before? with some movies and where it's all about family. Or you could be asking, and one thing that I think might come to mind is how does this sell it any better than what Shazam to Fury of the Gods try to do? So I, I do think it succeeds there because while Shazam 2 is still a movie about family marketed to families, I think the first movie had a lot more heart and sincerity to Billy Batson's plot that then developed into leaning a bit more into the action in the second movie. But, but my point being, where Blue Beetle succeeds over the recent Shazam sequel in my eyes in this department is that it has all of the heart of the hero's origin which keeps you very entertained especially with all of that scarab action but it does so without disregarding the, the burning bright heart of the family and, and the journey that they're all truly involved in together so Blue Beetle picks up at like a fairly slow pace but kind of what you would expect like you're only just somewhat getting into this character he hasn't got the scarab right from the very first second so you you know, you do start off fairly slow with setting the story up, getting to meet Jaime Reyes. And when I say slow, I just mean slow pacing in comparison to literally the rest of the movie and how when Jaime gets the Scarab, things from there on out move at a more rapid pace given what the Reyes family is up against. Let's just say there's a certain character who isn't happy at all with how Jaime has the Scarab in his possession. So the main threat here is more or less exactly what I expected with regards to Victoria Cord and Carapax the Indestructible Man. It does 
and again, I, I'm not going to deny it does get cliche a bit with what's being presented here in the plot. Again, no spoilers here, but just what you can tell from the trailers. You have Ted Cord's sister, Victoria Cord. She isn't happy that Jaime has got the scarab. In the trailer, you see her go after the scarab, but obviously using Carapax to do so. And he's somewhat that kind of video game-esque boss tasked with going after Jaime and having somewhat of his own you know, equipment, if you will, to face on Jaime when he's even in the Scarab get-up. So it, you know, lends to that kind of boss battle situation where there's not like a whole bunch of substance to Carapax. Although I will argue that there is somewhat of a surprising and interesting insight into his character as you get into the final act. But what I will still say is, despite this somewhat tropey, hey, I'm going to go up against you or give me the Scarab back. And it's like, well, no, I'm not going to let you do that. I'm going to fight you now, is the action. Like, it is still thoroughly entertaining with this pursuit from Victoria Cord Carapax to that of Jaime and his family. All while that unfolds, Jaime is finding his purpose. So, like, there is, once again, the underlying tropiness there, but everything that this movie really goes head over heels into with how it's trying to make it work and separate itself from the crowd of cliche and trope, you can tell very much so, that they did everything to make it as entertaining as they could for you. And and it is. And that that's the thing. And why is that? Well, I, I think this movie, one thing to praise about it is it, it just has such a great style and approach to Blue Beetle's abilities. You know, Ted Cord's old gadgets that you see in the trailer. It's very visually pleasing and has a good pacing to the action throughout the film. Again, once Heimer gets the Scarab. I've seen some people say that the VFX is like so poor from what they saw in the trailer. And I, I've, I honestly disagree. Again, as somebody who, in my opinion, and I think it's kind of universal now, but to be fair, there are still people denying it, saw the Flash movie and... I don't even need to talk about that, to be fair. I thought they did a really good job here with all the action sequences that was prepared with the fantastic choreography, by the way, in this movie. And of course, like the VFX that comes along with that, considering he is the Blue Beetle and he has a whole alien freaking arsenal at his ready that he's basically discovering throughout the movie. So as Jaime is having his fun in, you know, realizing that, hey, I can actually do this, I can do that. In the movie, you're having fun alongside the main character also. And specifically with regards to the choreography and all the action that you see, which is very, very frequent throughout the movie, which is again, one of the main attributes of what I think makes this a crowd pleaser paired with the other two main things, like a really emotional resonant plot with the family side of things, is that the film benefited from, I think, having that practical suit, because if you didn't know already, the Blue Beetle suit is is literally made. Shola Madduania is wearing it. Now, of course, it would have been CGI when he like rockets up into space and above Palmyra City and whatnot. But if they did the Flash approach, like in the third act when they were fighting the Kryptonians and you just had Ezra Miller literally full 3D model of him CGI, you would have been able to tell. And they, again, what I'm trying to say here is that I really appreciate the effort that they went to here to, to make it work. And I, I really don't get, like, maybe there's like one or two moments, but to, I, I wouldn't remotely for one second ever think that this is <laughs> on the same level as VFX for The Flash. And The Flash was a $330 million movie, including marketing. So 220 and Blue Beetle um, didn't have that budget, obviously. And it still looks pretty damn good. And speaking about looking good, I just want to go back to the, the visual style. I love Palmyra City. It, it looks so cool. And again, all while this isn't being like fully advertised as the first DCU movie and all of that, it did give me that kind of cool glimpse that, hey, we're getting a new DC universe in a couple of years time. And when you see this new city in this world, it is, it, it's like, it's so comic booky yet they've made it so real. Now, I, I wouldn't want to quite compare it on the exact same level as what Matt Reeves did with the Batman. Of course, I always have to bring it back to the Batman. But he, like, combined multiple different cities to kind of give you something that felt familiar but brand new, right? So Palmyra City, I feel like, in an interesting way, they've done something that is familiar but very new with blending in the kind of DC Universe fictional city into something that is like, hey, like, it's it's actually there and it gives me a true vibe of what this new realized 
universe that James Gunn is bringing our way could be like in a couple of years time. I thought the supporting cast was great. Uh, Bruna Marquezine, she was fantastic. She had great chemistry with Shola Madueña. Billy C. Escobedo was fantastic. Uh, George Lopez, <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. He brought a lot. I mean, everyone brought quite a bit of humor, but George Lopez basically had that dedicated role. And speaking of humor, like th this is where there was this other commentary happening about the movie from the trailers. Because, you know, you had that scene where you had uh, the grandmother with like basically the Gatling kind of chain gun going crazy. And even I was thinking, okay, okay. Not saying that she wouldn't do that to protect her family, but is this getting to like, cheese levels of where I'd find it a bit like, yeah, I don't know. So I will say it, it, it does get cheesy at points, but in the right kind of way, in where you accept the cheese, even if you don't like cheese usually, which is kind of where I'm at sometimes, depending on the cheese, if you will. And I'm sure those who love cheese in their movies will absolutely love the cheese in this movie. I hope that made sense. But truly, on the bottom line, I do think the cheesiness in this movie that, that they implemented suits it. Because albeit it does go over the top in several moments for me personally, and where I, I don't know if making it that cheesy or hanging on that moment was worth it. Like I knew what they were doing and they were very much so deliberately hanging on that close up of, again, let's just say the granny doing like a, you know, maniacal laugh as she was chain gunning. But it does get to the point in where the movie seems like it's very very self-aware of what it's doing and just outright embraces it and I respect that and I can't deny it does work with what they're going for a lot of the time. Also in moments like this I do try and ground myself because as you guys know on this channel I apply a lot of critical thinking when it comes to movies. Does it contradict anything that it was doing before? Is there like massive plot contrivances? But with what I was just talking about if anything it, it does play on the screen like that of reading a comic book. I can imagine these moments being in comic book panels in a Blue Beetle story. So don't get me wrong, I wouldn't call Blue Beetle the, the most airtight script, just like kind of a lot of comic book movies, to be honest. Not every single one, but it's not, you know, an unusual thing for me to say that when it comes to the comic book space that there's quite a few moments where my critical brain wants to ask questions and it's the kind of meme of don't ask questions. There's certain plot contrivances that will happen. For example, with Shazam 2, it's just like there's that moment where Dala had like a horde of what were deadly unicorns coming her way, but she uh, opens up the Skittle bag and it's like, of course, she happened to not die in that moment because they happened to like Skittle. Do you know what I mean? Some people like myself do take it into account because I think it does obviously come into the writing of the movie. How much does that plot contrivance or how much of the plot after that is predicated off of this one moment? Because if a whole bunch is, then that really kind of means that in my opinion, they could have maybe got there a bit more organically. But without me getting into my own version of a lecturing session here, my takeaway is there is certainly an approach to switching your brain off with certain things that happen in comic book movies. And Blue Beetle isn't really an exception there. But what's most important is that I'm still able to do that and have a blast with it. And this is something that I think people misconstrue all the time. Like if you apply certain levels of critical thinking to projects, automatically people think that you don't like it. And, and that really isn't the case at all because I could like nitpick as people like to call it this film quite a bit in other films, but there's still so much to enjoy at the same time. And with what Blue Beetle provides and all the things that I've praised so far, I am yet to praise one more thing that I think makes it so so very easy to enjoy. So with having said all of that, what makes this movie shine above all else is the exceptional Shola Madueña, of whom I would call a definitive casting for Jaime Reyes' Blue Beetle. So the way I kind of look at this aspect is for a movie I, that I think a lot of people are looking at the ingredients that have gone into it as pretty bland from what I'm seeing with takes online going into the release. He is by far the most integral part to the secret source that is making this work from the takes that I'm now seeing from people coming out the movie, really enjoying it, to the point of where you 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 get why people are really hyping him up. Like, I am so happy that he is Blue Beetle, and actually, I'm so happy 
that, you know, even outside of this movie, we are going to eventually see him again in the DCU. Now, whether we get a sequel, depending how the box office numbers go or not, you, you guys know my take here from covering this before. Whether we get a sequel or not, we will probably see him again, if not just pop up in another show, whether that's Peacemaker or Booster Gold or whatever. Regardless, I am so happy because Sherlock Mardwani is just so good. I think James Gunn is fully aware that he can't let this one go by on the wayside. Like, no matter what, he's bringing him into his new DCU and uh, the other cast members from what we're hearing as well. One of my favorite parts in the movie with him, without getting into spoilers, but what I will say is there's this particular moment towards the end of the movie with Jaime and Kajida the Scarab, and it's all building up to, like, this kind of moment, and those of you who have seen it know exactly what I'm on about, and there's this kind of track that's playing at the same time, and it was just all so heroically awesome, and I feel like that scene right there really you know, uh, sums up what is so enjoyable about this movie. And, you know, while I'm on the topic of that, let's, you know, very briefly talk about the score. Fantastic. It, it goes along so well with the movie, especially the fight scenes. It, it's got this kind of weird synthy kind of 80s vibe at times, especially the song that I was just talking about in that certain scene. You know, it almost had this weird Blade runner -y kind of vibe. Like, I'm not saying the whole thing is like Blade Runner, but it, it has these like, certain tones in it. And again, those who know the track I'm on about know what I'm on about. And I was addicted to that to the point of where instantly after hearing that track in that scene, that scene towards the end of the movie, when things are really ramping up for Jaime and it was getting very sentimental, I wanted to go <laughs> to Spotify and check it out right away. Now, there is quite a few Easter eggs in the movie because, again, no spoilers here. This is something that is very public knowledge just from the basic first trailer. We saw the previous Blue Beetle suits in Ted Kord's HQ and uh, essentially, you know, there, there are kind of cool insights into things like that. Uh, there's even, again, more Easter eggs right towards the beginning of the movie, which is pretty cool. And, you know, when we come to post credit scenes, I would recommend if, if you, it depends if you're pressed on time, you can stick around for both of them. I would say the second one right at the end of the credits isn't remotely important, but the first one, the mid credit scene is pretty damn important and directly teases uh, a continuation, like a sequel, if they were to pursue that. And it's very, 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 very intriguing. And what I might do in terms of like a full on spoiler talk is get you guys involved and we'll do like a discussion series Q&A spoiler review where I give my thoughts on all kinds of things. So yeah, check out the first post credit scene. Very intriguing stuff if you want a tease of what's to come next. Throughout the movie as well, there's just like general things and, and other Easter eggs. Some of the most surface ones are like Palmera City. And again, this isn't spoiler, it's in the trailer. You can literally see LexCorp as one of the buildings. So there's many things to that to other like deep things where it's like, oh damn, if you know what you're looking for. So all in all, guys, I would say that Blue Beetle was a very fun time. It may have on paper all of the ingredients to where, as I've seen many takes online, because, you know, I've been covering it for a long time now, ever since the first trailer, even before that, and where it comes across on paper as somewhat of this bland recipe. But don't let that shy you away from what is a very, very heartfelt, high-spirited, family, somewhat driven movie. And I mean family-driven movie in the best kind of way. Don't take that in like a negative, oh, another family movie. I really do mean that. It is surprisingly emotionally hitting there. It also didn't surprise me as well in some ways in where I always had the faith that it would be entertaining in its action and its heroic adventure with Shola Mardwenia shining through as the Blue Beetle. That is one thing that I think really brought brings it up to a level of entertainment and where it's worth buying a ticket for the action of the Blue Beetle versus Carapax, even if there's some villainous kind of tropes there with a somewhat basic premise of, oh, I want the Scarab back. Oh, I'm going to fight you to kind of get it. There's still a lot to play with and everything is kind of decorated on the cake nicely to make it still worth a, a purchase and, and a very good time. I really do mean that. So while I don't think Blue Beetle, uh, you know, reinvents the wheel, as they say, or completely breaks the mold and it's like hey you think you've seen superhero origins here's the new precedent for superhero origin movies for the next 20 years no it, it doesn't it's not the most perfect movie but i think it deserves people to go see it i think it would be honestly 
and this is what I'm afraid of. It would be a big shame if nobody bothers to go see it. But, you know, it's quite cool to see that from what we've seen so far. Critics are loving it. You can also see that the audience is also really loving it. So I do have faith that it will do better than Shazam, Fury of the Gods. I really hope so because I only made 133 million or 136. Terrible, by the way. Um, I just want Blue Beetle. I think it could be one of those things where it might not get as much money as it deserves, but... If you were going to take one thing from me and you were like, should I go see it? Should I not go see it? Go see it. I'm not saying it's like pure Kino cinema, but don't think that it's complete bottom of the pile. Oh, God. Like, here's another bloody Spider-Man Homecoming. My God. like No, I, I think it does stand on its own two feet. So let me know if you have seen Blue Beetle down in the comments below. Please, if you're going to put spoilers, use a spoiler tag. Like, leave a couple of spaces so you have to click read more to see a comment if you're dying to post some kind of spoiler thoughts. Let me know if you agree with me. Let me know if you completely disagree with me. And let me know if you haven't seen it yet, but you're going to go check it out. And maybe if I even persuaded you to check it out. But that is everything I've got to wrap ramble about and i've rambled for quite a while but until next time guys i would just really appreciate a like on this video do consider sharing it out there on the internet whether that's twitter or some other place it helps me out a lot but until next time thank you so much for watching hope you all have a lovely rest of your day and i'll see you fellow blue beetles in the next video goodbye